The Right Reverend Paul Jones embraced his service to the Lord from his first days as a priest. An early Time magazine wrote about Bishop Jones and how he got to Utah. Bishop Franklin Spaulding spoke to students at the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, pleading for help in a difficult Utah. Whom shall we send, and who will go? Paul Jones echoed Isaiah, Here I am, send me. Like Spalding, the new priest was a socialist and a peaceful man dedicated to serve humanity. He started that service at St. John's with an instant love for the nearby university. He turned his rectory at the old St. John's into a student hangout. They had a reading room, a music room, and the first library in the Cache Valley. Students flocked to discuss issues and to socialize. He decorated the room with a Yale banner, part of his Eastern heritage. The Reverend Paul Jones and his co-director, the Reverend Donald Johnson, turned St. John's into a rousing success. It grew to the point of needing a substantial church and a place for the new cow that somehow the enthusiastic vicar found. The likable Jones addressed the students at what is now Utah State. And the school asked the fair-minded Paul Jones to referee college football games. Official newspaper stats indeed show the field judge for the big games as the Reverend Paul Jones. That's when he wasn't the head linesman. The vicar of St. John's would turn the new church in St. John's house into a community magnet. He truly understood community needs such as running water and let dirty farmers and students clean their bodies and wash away their sins with both fresh bath water and a spectacular church. The annual report said they served over 9,000 people who checked out 534 books and took 573 baths. He simply embraced the community. We have so much to learn from the life of the saint whom we call Bishop Paul Jones. But at the time he arrived in Utah, he was fresh out of university and, and filled with a vigor to serve God's people. He arrived in Logan and immediately started seeing less perhaps the needs of inside the church doors and more the needs of the people, practical needs. And so he brought hope and dignity to the people of Logan, what we strive to do in the church today. But life would quickly change. The diocese would be shocked to learn that on September 25th, 1914, 49-year-old Bishop Spalding was struck by an automobile on Salt Lake South Temple Street, he was killed instantly. Paul Jones was the natural choice to continue Bishop Spaulding's work. He became the fourth bishop of the Missionary District of Utah. He continued to seek workers, such as coal miners in Carbon County. Under Bishop Jones, there would be church services in Carbon and Emory counties, including Castlegate, and the place where coal mining and trains came together, Helper. The peaceful man also spoke out against the impending war that we now know as World War I. The Security League said he went too far when he challenged those who he felt equated patriotism with a large military. It was too much for a country looking to go to war it was too much for a church. An aging Bishop Tuttle, now the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, came back to celebrate in Utah. But one could see a growing rift over the pacifist views in the church. The Dean of St. Mark's Cathedral, the very Reverend William Fleetwood on the left in the white, had a powerful vestry, as did St. Paul's. They threw fuel on the fire. 
The Dean and Vestry of St. Mark's joined the Vestry of Salt Lake St. Paul's to call for the involuntary resignation in this letter sent to Bishop Jones' residence by Western Union. Ironically, the man who started it all in Utah would end it all for Bishop Paul Jones. Presiding Bishop Daniel Tuttle led an investigation. Throughout his ministry, Bishop Paul Jones found he not only had a belief in our call from Jesus Christ to be people of peace, that he had a deep and abiding conviction to peace. In fact, so deep that history would tell us it doesn't seem that he could divide how he understood his theology from how he understood himself. And so knowing it would not be popular, he aligned himself with the way he understood and lived the gospel. He stood firmly with the Prince of Peace. He saw that the end was near. Time Magazine would later recount the House of Bishops' investigations. Jones asked, does the commission find that I have been affiliated with seditious organizations? The HOB did not charge seditious organizations, but questioned organizations in respect of the loyalty to the government. And facing a certain ouster, the Right Reverend Paul Jones resigned, but he held true his pledge to help the Lord's work. Bishop Jones found himself in a very difficult and tenuous situation because he had to have had the scripture running through his head, you are to be, you know, in this world, but not of this world. And that, you know, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. And in this case, Bishop Jones lost his position as bishop in the church, not because he broke any laws. He, he gave to the government, he gave to the church, canons, the rules, everything that was due them. But what he didn't give was his belief that Jesus shows us the way to live differently than the world does. And he refused to give that up. And so the consequence was that he was asked to, well, demand it, that he step down as the bishop. Very interesting to think about, because just like Jesus broke no laws, just as Martin Luther King Jr. stood on the right side of the law, the convictions that one holds often cause so much fear when we hold to the truths that Jesus brought to us that the world doesn't know how to accept those truths. So from the time of Jesus through Paul Jones to Martin Luther King Jr. to us, there is the saying that holds true, perhaps I would be condemned more often if I proclaimed the gospel more truthfully. He continued his path to serve the Lord. He wrote about mission and equal rights and remained a faithful servant. Salt Lake ministers of all faiths offered support for his witness. He got his seat back in the House of Bishops in 1933 a seat he held until he died in 1941 while helping Jewish people who were displaced by the Nazis. And in 1994, the church that once removed him as bishop honored him with a feast day we now know as Paul Jones Day, a feast day for a champion of the Lord's work as the Prince of Peace. His old church stands as a legacy but he is remembered far wider than in Logan and in the diocese. The brave stand of a peaceful man led the same church that forced him to resign to later honor him. He is the only Utahan and one of the few people in the world to now have his own feast day in the church. So here we find ourselves coming to September 4th as a day of celebration and a feast day to remember the ministry of Paul Jones. But the only way that day came about was for the church who, that itself had said, we cast you out as one who is disreputable amongst us. That very church had to say, we 
see what you were saying now. We understand the error of our ways and we seek reconciliation with you and honor you and the voice that though we couldn't hear it, says the church, we now hear it. My friends, this is the work of becoming beloved community. This is the work that we have to do to carry on the legacy and lineage of Bishop Paul Jones in the Diocese of Utah. We stand in a state that has much within our own history and certainly as witnesses of that we need to be reconcilers of, we need to find ways to amend the past, to find a healthier whole way forward. We need to have the courage that Bishop Jones had to speak the truth, even if it is not popular in our own time. The only way, the only way this feast day is possible is because Bishop Jones held his opinions and kept to them with full integrity. He did not denigrate those who disagreed with him, those who maligned him. And because he did not, because he stood in full integrity, the church was able to find its way back to him. That is what it means to be people of peace. How we are to wonder as we celebrate the feast day, we remember the legacy of Bishop Jones. How are we to be agents of such peace, such dignity, and such truth in our own times? We can learn much from the peaceful man. He did not go into a bitter retreat after losing his Utah jurisdiction. He did not forget what he told Bishop Spalding, Here I am, Lord. Amen.